fucking sad in general. Like, I do feel like it's sad. If Alvey's an animal sanctuary, Kether's house a fucking animal thunderdome. I don't know. Listen, shit happens, dude. Shit happens to pets. Pets are like little children on fucking steroids, you know? They're constantly trying to kill themselves. Um, not, It's not just shit happens. I mean, it, it's true. But to be fair, he probably shouldn't have this many pets because clearly he can't take care of them. That's my take. You also shouldn't leave your dogs outside unless they're like naturally outside dogs. And even then, you're going to run into issues no matter what. You know what I mean? But I think it's like, he probably has like a big property in Florida where you can have a big property. And he takes advantage of that by uh, leaving his dogs, letting his dogs roam outside when there's like animals and shit. Did you call the dog an issue right now? What? That doesn't even make sense. Like, if you're going to try to bait me, do a better job. Why Ireland Ireland is divided, uh, I'm not going to do that. I want to do fun shit. Let's move on to some fun shit before Dragon's Dogma. This is a video about how Japanese swords are made. Swords that are strong enough and sharp enough to slice a bullet in half. The access we got for this video is incredible. We were able to film everything from gathering the iron sand, to smelting the iron, forging the sword, to sharpening and polishing it. They even let us use it. That is so oh, cool! Oh, dude! The method of making these swords has remained virtually unchanged for Dude, I've done all that. I'm just saying. Hundreds of years, with everything done by hand. They are still considered to be among the best in the world. The Japanese made a weapon that was the absolute pinnacle for their style of warfare and the materials they had at hand. These swords are held in such high regard that one from the 16th century has been appraised at $105 million, oh. making it the most expensive sword ever built. That's so sick. God, I love Japan so much. In the much. Shimane oh province of Japan, there is a smelter that is lit for only one night each year, where steel is made in the same way it was 1,300 years ago. It's known as the Tatara method. And Bro, it's $150 million because it automatically, it automatically gives you plus 10 intelligence, plus 20 dexterity, plus 40 strength. It's literally maxed out. It's actually taken out of the rotation because it's so OP. It's broken. They had to literally nerf it. And only steel made in this way ends up in the very best Japanese swords. And we were invited to come film it. Just after 9 a.m., the ceremonial prayers are said and the fire is lit by a Shinto priest. Everyone that will be working the smelter will be here for at least the next 24 hours. That includes Veritasium producer, Peter. I'm committed. We're going to do this. You hate to see other people live your dreams like this, though. Like, actually. But, you know, that's my fault, I guess, for having such ridiculous dreams rather than dreaming about the top of the hour ad break coming and going without me recognizing it. Now, of course... If you are subscribed for $5 or for free, then let me tell you, it won't be a dream. It'll be a reality. Because at the top of the hour, there is a three-minute ad break. 
And I dream of a future where everyone is subscribed for five dollars or for free, or by getting gifted a sub, so they no longer have to see the top of the RM break. Here's the demon break now. It's gonna be fun. Sword making in Japan goes back about three thousand years, but in those days, swords were made out of bronze. We're not sure how people first learned to smelt metal, but it was likely related to pottery. In that you were using these rocky ores to make glazes and such for pottery under very controlled atmospheres, and then find in, maybe the potters found metallic beads in the bottom of the furnaces that they were firing it. This possibly gave them the idea. Bronze was discovered before steel because it's an alloy of copper and usually tin, both metals with low enough melting points that they can be smelted in regular pottery kilns. The problem with bronze is that although it can be sharpened, it's too soft to hold an edge for long. So Japanese sword makers shifted to steel 1200 years ago in the Heian period. This <laughs> Your katana posture was dope as fuck though, literal samurai. Come on, dude. I did not do 9-11, okay? Please stop. This is what most people would recognize as a Japanese sword. It's made of steel with a curved blade. Steel is an alloy of iron, the fourth most common element in Earth's crust. The oceans of the world used to be rich with dissolved iron. But two and a half billion years ago, cyanobacteria started photosynthesizing and creating oxygen. The iron reacted with that oxygen, precipitating out of solution to be deposited at the bottom of the ocean. Incidentally, the cyanobacteria were poisoned by the oxygen that they themselves produced, so it's thought that when levels got high enough, they died off. And as a result, oxygen levels dropped and iron no longer precipitated out of solution. Then the cyanobacteria could multiply again and the cycle repeated. That's why most of the world's iron is found in layers of sedimentary rock called banded iron formations. Each layer of iron was formed during a global flourishing of cyanobacteria that infused the ocean with oxygen. The Yo, come on, man. Get what the fuck is this science shit, bro? Let me see the goddamn swords, man. Show me the fucking Japanese dudes pumping that shit. The majority of the global iron supply comes from these banded iron formations Fuck. because of their high concentration of iron, up to around 60% iron oxide by weight. Oh, this is so cool. I get but it. You Japan, guys are nerds, with its okay? mostly I get volcanic it. so geology, smart. has barely any of these sedimentary iron oxides. And this is likely why the country was late to the steel production game. Archaeologists have found steel artifacts in Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, that are nearly 4,000 years old. See, now I'm interested. Okay, that's right. Turks invented steel. Recognize, son. But in Japan, metals, including steel, were imported from China and Korea up until the 8th century, when Japan started making its own steel. So where did they get the raw ingredients? Well, igneous rocks like granite and diorite still contain iron oxides, just in much lower concentrations. But as the mountains are weathered, these iron oxides are broken apart and washed downstream. Eventually, they become part of the sand. The Japanese noticed that because iron oxides are denser than other minerals in the sand, they accumulate in places where the river changes direction or speed. The heavier iron sinks to the bottom and the lighter material is washed away. To amplify this effect, they deliberately created diversions in the river to increase the concentration of iron. What do you do is you dam off a section of river and then you drag sand into it. Because iron is heavier than the other parts of the sand, it is the thing that gets left behind and everything else gets washed downstream. With this method, you can get iron sands with 80% iron oxides by weight. That's more concentrated than high quality iron ore. And since it has fewer impurities, it's an excellent source material for high quality steel. If you heat up those iron oxides to over 1250 degrees Celsius, you can break the bonds with oxygen and get pure iron. But pure iron is actually softer than bronze. 
so in its elemental state iron provides no advantage. But nature gave humans a lucky break. One of the few ways you can heat something up to 1250 degrees is with charcoal. And charcoal is basically pure carbon. And if you add just a little bit of carbon to iron, it creates an incredibly strong alloy, steel. Yeah, a lot of people see it as a heat process. I, I see it as a chemical process. Alloys Nerd. are usually stronger than pure metals because they contain different sized atoms. And this reduces the ability of atoms to slide past each other when an external force is applied. So I've just been given gloves, other gloves. That and a looks fucking sick, dude. Towel, That's what so I'm talking about. Get to the good much, shit. Uh, getting real. Without nerves, there would be no katanas for you to coom I'm over. Whatever, genuinely dude. quite worried. And here is the room with all of the charcoal that we're going to be using overnight. There's just bags and bags of this stuff. There's a Buddha saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. I'm here. Okay. So we're lining up on the four, four corners, I guess. Whoa. Oh boy, didn't do a great job of that. <laughs> So the rain is coming, so we're quickly getting all of the charcoal out and then measuring it. So each bag of these is 10 kilos. Okay. So with the iron sand, it is mixed together with water because if you don't mix it with water and you put it on the plane, it just flies straight up. But if you mix it with too much water, then there is water that's gonna heat up, it's gonna become water vapor and the whole kiln could explode. Terrifyingly enough, they do this by feel. They mix in enough water until the iron sand is clumpy, but again, if it's too much, the whole thing could explode. Coco, Coco, hi. <laughs> this, is, this is how you know Japan fell off. You know before they never let white boys touch any part of that process, agreed. Japanese economy in the dumps, dude. They're like, please, we need, we have too much deflation. Please, white boy, <laughs> come save us. Show us the fucking, show us the way. Okay, put some iron in. Weebs single-handedly are keeping the Japanese economy alive. I am, that much I am certain of. And I say this as a weeb myself, and it is my honor to keep the Japans alive. It is just past four in the afternoon and over the last couple of hours, we have added 250 kilograms of charcoal and nearly 60 kilograms of iron sand. So yeah, it's a slow process, but I think, I think we're starting to get somewhere. I have no idea because obviously the thing is hidden, but it should be growing. To achieve the high temperatures required to make steel, you need a strong, steady supply of oxygen. For hundreds of years, this was provided by huge foot-operated bellows. It would have taken an around-the-clock, full-body effort by many men to maintain the furnace's temperature. When I came here, I was a little bit sad that the bellows were electric. I really wanted to, you know, have this proper experience, have this proper workout of stepping on these bellows for 24 hours. The temperature inside the smelter gets up to 1500 degrees Celsius, just below the melting point of iron, which is 1538 Celsius. So the iron being smelted isn't liquid, but it's soft and malleable enough to clump together into a big block of iron. No matter how high quality the iron sand is, there will always be some impurities, like sulfur, phosphorus, and silicon oxides. They combine with carbon from the charcoal and melt at a lower temperature than iron, 
so they become liquid and flow to the bottom. This is known as slag. After many slag. more hours of adding charcoal and iron sand, it is time for the first removal of the slag. Before the first removal of slag, another prayer is said. Oh, that's insane. You bloody slag. Work, you fucking slags. Hatamoto. <laughs> So for the last three hours, there's been three processes that we've been doing. One is adding the charcoal, two is adding the iron sand, and three is opening up the smelter from the bottom to break apart the impurities so they can flow out. <laughs> I, I just know that feels good as fuck for the forge. Oh, you know it. Getting all that out of your system. Look at this white boy learning the value of a yen, you know what I mean? Just want you guys to know that it's 3.16 in the morning and I'm still here and I'm really sleepy. So it's currently six o'clock in the morning. The next day we've been smelting for 21 hours. I'm exhausted, but the sun is about to come out and it's been pretty amazing. I gotta be honest. We gotta close these doors really quick before they get mad at me. At 9 a.m. the next morning, the smelting is complete. A total of 614 kilograms of iron sand and 670 kilograms of charcoal were added to the smelter. At this point, in a traditional smelter, the only way to get the steel out would be to break it apart. These days, a crane is used to take the smelter apart. Oh, wow, okay. Oh! And what is left to show for all that wow. hard work is a 100 kilogram block of steel, iron, and slag. Only around a third of this block is high enough quality to be used in sword making. Oh, that's insane. That's so cool. The result for all the hard work. This is step one of making a Japanese sword. The steel is sorted by quality and carbon content, which is also done by eye. In fact, this is one of the exams you need to pass to be certified as a swordsmith. Then the different grades of steel are sent out to one of 300 swordsmiths around the country. Only 30 do it as their full-time job. And one of them is Akihira Kokaji, who we went to visit next. This is when the forging of the sword begins. In a coal oven with hand-pumped bellows, the steel is heated until it is soft and malleable. Then, using hammers, the master swordsmith flattens out the steel. Okay, this is a serious question, and I don't even know if, like, uh, you guys would be good answerers of this question. But, like, I don't fully understand why they're doing the slag the old-fashioned way. Is it just tradition? Is it supposed to be, like, better? Less impurities? Like, what? Like, that makes no sense, kind of. In the old days, this would have been done by the swordsmith and three apprentices. The swordsmith using a smaller hammer would set the rhythm, and the apprentices would use big mallets to flatten the steel. Woo! <laughs> that was uh, terrifying. These days, electric hammers are used. When the steel... What do you mean? What do I mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? Like, uh, the modern methods of, of creating steel are probably infinitely more efficient, infinitely less time-consuming, infinitely less labor-intensive, and probably 
yield way less uh, imperfections. It has to be specifically for the fucking vibes. There are literally laws in Japan that only allow swords to be made by traditional methods, hence they're considered art pieces and not weapons illegal to own. ...is flat enough, it is then bent back on itself. And it is then hammered again to press the steel back together into a solid block. So why go to all this effort, flattening the steel only to fold it back on itself and end up with a chunk of steel the same size as before? Well, because folding does two very important things. First, it spreads out the impurities like silicon, sulfur, and phosphorus. It spreads them out throughout the steel. This ensures a uniform consistency without any weak points. Second, it gives the steel a grain. After Nihon folding the sword- 1,000 folded 1,000 1, times. Nihon, Nihon steel. Sword, it is now reinforced in the direction that it will be hit in combat. And as a bonus, the steel is exposed to the air. So there is a small amount of oxidation creating a darker colored steel, which when folded makes beautiful patterns. There are some swords which have more than a billion layers. Now this doesn't mean the sword has been folded a billion times, since every fold doubles the number of layers. So you only need about 30 folds to get a billion layers. But usually a sword is folded 10 to 13 times, resulting in a few thousand layers of steel. Now, a blade isn't made from a single block of steel. The carbon content affects how hard the steel is, so different carbon percentages are used in different parts of the blade. Because carbon atoms are much smaller than iron atoms, they can fit inside the crystal lattice of iron. These trapped carbon atoms then apply an outward force to the lattice, putting the steel under stress. The higher the carbon percentage, the harder and more rigid the steel. But this hardness comes at a cost. The steel becomes brittle, making it more likely to chip and shatter rather than bend. So what swordsmiths do is they use steel with different carbon contents for different parts of the blade. The edge is always high carbon steel to make it hard and rigid so it can maintain a sharp edge for a long time. But the spine is usually made of lower carbon steel, which allows the sword to flex without breaking. This is done by welding together pieces of steel with May different thy knife carbon chip contents. And so uh, we have about a 15 minute break because, you know, it takes a while for the iron to heat up and then meld together and then we're back in there. It's very hot. It's very, very hot in there. It's kind of unbelievable that he can do this for four hours at a time. After the sword is hammered into shape, which is a straight. Yeah, we don't know how to make Damascus steel, I think, right? It's been lost. I mean, there's like copycats, but it's not real Damascus steel, right? I think. Great blade. It is covered in a layer of clay, a thick layer for the spine and a thin layer for the blade itself. It's then heated in the furnace and then rapidly cooled in water, a process known as quenching. Now, because the layers of clay have different thicknesses, the rate of cooling is faster for the edge than the spine. When the steel is heated, carbon enters the iron lattice. And since the spine of the sword is covered in thick clay, it will cool slowly, giving time for the carbon atoms to leave the iron matrix. This will lead to a very low carbon steel called ferrite. But the carbon atoms which have left the matrix will be caught by other iron atoms and create a type of steel known as cementite. The combination of ferrite and cementite is known as perlite, and it's a mostly soft and ductile form of steel, though parts of it are hard due to the cementite. So perlite forms the I don't know what it is about the male brain, but I, I don't know what it is, but I legitimately, like, I have a yearning for more swords like i just i love swords and i i feel like i need to have more of them like it kind of makes me understand gun guys you know what i mean 
the spine of the sword. In contrast, the very thin layer of clay on the blade means that it cools very rapidly, so more of the carbon is trapped in the lattice. This forces the lattice structure to change from cubic to tetragonal, making a form of steel known as martensite. Since the trapped carbon puts stress on the lattice, martensite is incredibly hard, exactly what you'd want for the edge of a sword. The tetragonal lattice structure of martensite also takes- <laughs> Chatters it? No. Don't join the dark side. My friend, not only do I own multiple swords, I literally made my own sword. Except more space, so the edge of the blade expands relative to the spine, curving the like sword backwards. Like I blacksmithed backwards. my own the sword. The iconic curve of a samurai sword comes from the formation of martensite. You can actually see the boundary between different types of steel in a finished sword by the difference in color. This is known as hamon, which literally means edge pattern. At the Victoria Albert Museum in London, there is a Japanese sword that has a very detailed little dragon in the hamon, and I've looked at it many times and I don't, okay, I don't know how he did that. <laughs> About one third of all blades shatter during the quenching process. You quench it once and you thank. Not me, bitch. Not me. Y'all already fucking know. You saw my ass hit that fucking quench. The stars that you made it. <laughs> the sword is then. No, you just bent it. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Gil literally was shocked at how straight my sword was. You literally did? No, dude, you're misremembering. I think you're confusing me with what Will did. Supposed to be like that. Is it supposed to be on fire? What's wrong? <laughs> oh god, we used the wrong oil. That's cooking oil. It's on fire. Alright. That one looks pretty straight. Oh god. Damn, oh, you want me to let go? No, yeah, you're good, you're good. Oh, okay. I got it. I got it. Hasan, I got the coolest video. Of oh all time. shit, that is so perfect. Oh, wow. Let's go! Yeah. Take a look. Oh gosh. <laughs> He literally said, that is the straightest sword. I was not expecting it. Then placed back in the forge to evaporate any remaining water. This also provides a little bit of energy to loosen some of the crystal structures, making the sword less brittle. And that's about the extent of the tempering process on a Japanese sword, which that, that might be enough to relax things a bit, but they kept the edge much harder than you would have in the West. After the sword is forged, it is sent to a polisher. The polishing and sharpening of a sword is also done by hand, with whetstones of different coarsenesses. It can take a month to sharpen and polish a single sword. One of the things that I love is that like, the, this table is sloping down and the entire floor over there is sloping down. So when you like add, add the water, all of the residue and all the water you know, flows downhill, so it's not perfectly flat. Sometimes the swords are also engraved with beautiful patterns, though this is quite rare. And after all that, the sword is done. To learn how to use a Japanese sword, Peter got a lesson from a master, Takara Takanashi. He is the 10th generation student of Miyamoto Musashi, a legendary samurai. Musashi killed his first opponent in single combat at the age of 13. 
awesome. He spent the rest of his life perfecting his sword fighting, inventing so a new sick. technique with two swords. Yo! Musashi this is the guy that came before Zoro, bro. Dude, he invented dual wielding. He fought in more than 60 duels to the death, and he won every last one of them. There is a story about a duel that took place during a snowstorm. That's always funny to think about, like, the first... I've talked about this before, like, the first guy to invent flanking just cooked so hard. Like, so much shit that we take for granted now in the science of warfare, someone invented it. And the first guy that did it, everyone was like, that is the most insane thing that I've ever fucking seen in my life. Like, this guy... He's too powerful. Like, some guy was like, why don't we just go around them? Same with, like, the guy with the two swords. Everyone was like, what the fuck? Nobody thought about having two swords? As he faced his opponent, Katana outstretched. Musashi was so calm and kept his sword so still that snowflakes began to accumulate on the thin edge of the blade. So during the lesson, I thought I would get to use a katana, but instead we spent the entire time learning how to take the blade out of its sheath and then put it back in. So yeah. when I actually got the chance to use a katana to slice through some things, I was deeply unprepared. Okay, so this has been an amazing day. We've uh, looked at some beautiful katanas, and now these wonderful people are letting me use one of their just unbelievably beautiful pieces of art to chop some things. <sighs> like, this is kind of the best day ever. There really is something remarkable about Japanese swords. The amount of care, better. attention, and expertise that each step requires, from the gathering and refining of the iron sand, to the smelting, to the forging and sharpening a sword, each step takes so much time and skill. He didn't flick it. Disgraceful. He literally just put it, he, he, he whipped it like a baseball bat. He didn't flick it. That's all I'm going to say. It's incredible that all these things were discovered by trial and error to produce artifacts of such high quality that they are still prized centuries later. Before I made this video, I didn't really appreciate that swords can be art. To me, it's a good reminder that whatever you do, you should do it with deep care, attention to detail, and love for the craft. Do that enough times, and you might just make something beautiful. Hey, this part of the video was brought to you by Henson Shaving. Look at the way, dude, look at how natural that is, though. Look, look. <laughs> look at that. That's natural. You have to admit that that's natty. Okay.
that's clean. And if you fucking act like that's not clean, like me wiping the blood off my sword. <laughs> You're not a hot tomato, little bro. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am Anjin. Pairing into ladies' private quarters. It's not proper. Manji will none you more sort of. Worse than that, it's vulgar. Unholy perversion. Harau tatte te no de gozai mashu. Okuni de wa onna no kao nozoku koto ga buchouho na furumai nano da to. Koko wa Hinomoto ja. Am I the only man present who treasures the purity of a woman? Go yosha kudasai mase. Hinomoto no fushi ni narete inai no desu. I will set fires the Edo for Lady Muriku. Oh, woman's virtue is our glory. Um, Buntaro split in that arrow blackout drunk. What a badass, a douchebag. Oh my god, dude. Every character in this fucking show is so sick. Right on us all. My god, the shame of it. <laughs> I do love, I do love uncle though. Like uncle is the goat for me. I've, so, I've told you guys this already. It, everyone is so sick, but Fuji keeps the blapper ready. <laughs> you sure are a silly little man. And your hair looks like a tail of a pony. And <laughs> I worked with her on Monarch Legend of Monsters. That's sick. Hassan, have you ever watched the original? No, but my uh, my dad has watched the original. <laughs> 